Last year was our first year at the elementary school with my kids in the younger grades. And I'd say there were typically maybe four or five bikes out on the bike racks um, beforehand. Since we've started the bike bus, I think half the game is just showing people that biking to school is possible. And that's my hope with the bike bus is even though we're not able to do it every week, just based on our constraints of volunteers and bandwidth and, and funding, it's showing kids that it's possible. And we've anecdotally, I've seen a lot more kids biking to school, maybe 20 or 30 kids on the bike racks on, on warmer weather days. And it's just a blast. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Alan Kogel from Denver, Colorado. We're gonna be talking about active mobility in Denver and his new bike bus that he got started uh, for the local school where his kids go to school. Uh, it is a good one, but it's another long one. So let's get right to it with Alan. Alan Kogel, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. I'm excited to be here. So, Alan, if you wouldn't mind, just please give uh, a quick little background on who you are. Yeah, uh, my name's Alan Kogil. I'm from Denver, Colorado. Uh, volunteer with the uh, Denver Bicycle Lobby and also occasionally with the Denver Streets Partnership. I use uh, get around via cargo bike, take my kids to school, go shopping, things like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Advocate for safer streets and uh, multimodal transportation. Fantastic. Well, I really, I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you here today is, is talk a little bit about that whole scene there in Denver and the fact that you all are, are doing some really exciting things. Uh, but it made me kind of step back and think of a little bit about how I first heard about you. And I think it had to be uh, Arlie uh, Greenwald uh, back when she had her shop uh, there in Denver, which was just a wonderful family cycle re shop and cargo bike shop. And uh, I, I paid her a visit. I was uh, doing some uh, video work up in Boulder and I'm like, oh, I got to get down and see Arlie. And so I sh paid her a visit at her shop and we were just talking and we were talking about advocacy and some of the exciting things that were happening in Denver and your name came up. Now, does that, that sound about right? Is that probably how I first heard about you? It could have been. Arlie's amazing. <laughs> we were so lucky to have her in Denver for so many years. Mm -hmm. She's been in not only the bike shop industry, is in racing, um, and and has been a tremendous advocate. I look at her as a mentor in the space around just encouraging more people to bike and showing people the possibility of biking. I was actually over at her shop last weekend. Uh, Mackenzie Hart uh, took it over. It's now Hart Family Cycling, so it's still the shop is still going strong. Yeah. But uh, she's doing some great stuff out in the Carolinas, doing some great stuff for yeah. uh, Turn now. And I'm, I'm excited to see what's what's new for her. But yeah, I, I definitely miss having her in town. Yeah, yeah. And I just pulled up her website here, uh, Bike Shop Girl, and she still produces a fair amount of content because she's also a content creator. She's got a fabulous YouTube channel. And as you mentioned, she's doing a lot of the marketing work for Turn Bicycles, uh, which is fantastic. You know, there's a, a great uh, turn right there that looked like a GSD. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I think that's that had to have been the, the very first time that 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 I had heard about you. And then we eventually had the opportunity to meet. Now, it, was it the first time that we actually formally met? Was this past, uh, you know, what was it, June when we had the uh, the community bicycle ride? Yeah, yeah, with the ride for uh, racial justice uh, yeah. that Marcus and Neil put on. Yeah, I think that was yeah, the yeah. first time I actually got to see you in real life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know that you saw me the year prior, the summer prior, when I was filming the e-bike videos for Bicycle Colorado. That's right. Uh, yeah, I was kind you, of stalking you, in the background. You, yeah, you, while you were, yeah, I think you were either riding by or whatever you were stalking in the background. But, I think uh, you're talking to our, our state senator, Julie Gonzalez, I, th I think yeah. around the time. She's an amazing force for good here Yeah, yeah. In, in Denver. Yeah. 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 That, that's fantastic. Well, and, and let's talk a little bit about that scene, that scenario that is happening in, in Denver. And you, you had mentioned that we, you know, we had that opportunity to meet, uh, you know, this past June in, uh, there in Denver during that community bike ride, uh, that, uh, that Marcus and, and Neil were, you know, had helped put together. And I think this was like the third year in a row that they had done, uh, that particular uh, sort of Juneteenth uh, celebration ride there in in the in the area, but after the ride, 
you wanted to show me something really cool, which was the Blake Street Protected Bikeway. And I think this is indicative of some of the positive stuff that is actually happening in in Denver. Uh, we're going to talk about something else that's really positive, which is the bike buses that are that are popping up and and some of the other what I like to call software activity assets, the policies and the programs and the engagement activities. But this is an example of the amazing hardware that is starting to to you know, emerge in the city. And it's really super, super important. And what I want to do is I want to play in the background where, while we're talking, I'll, I'll play a little bit at the beginning. We'll, we'll, there'll be some, there'll, there'll be a little bit of introduction, but I want to play the video of our bicycle ride because you wanted to show me Blake Street and then, uh, in, and you helped guide me to the uh, Union Station so I could catch my bus back to Boulder again. Uh, so let's, let's pull this up. Let's pull up this video. Here we go. We'll start at the beginning. Boom. This used to be such a horrible way to try to get to Union Station. And yeah. when they put this in, it's, it's just been great. So this is the Blake Street protected bikeway, brand new. I love it. Hey, just look at the... And what's great about this too, and I'm going to turn the, the audio down now. What's great about this is, is that these are lighter, quicker, cheaper materials. They're still robust enough that they are, you know, make it clear to motor vehicle drivers that, uh, you know, this is, the streetscape has changed, but this stuff can go down in a matter of months. You know, the, certainly the, the majority of the, the, prep time is in the design side, the planning side, but then the actual installation is re relatively fast compared to having to put in, uh, you know, actual, you know, formed concrete and, and pouring concrete. This type of material can happen very, very fast. You had mentioned that this has been huge for the city. Talk a little bit more about that. Expand upon that. Yeah. You know, the, this, this bike lane uh, really has had a major connection from the Five Points neighborhood into lower downtown and downtown. There used to be nothing here and it was, it was terrifying. You could either, you know, go, you know, half mile out of your way to get on the South Flat Trail or kind of, you know, snake your way through downtown on these dangerous arterial streets. Um, and I love this one. You can see there, if you look at the little, um, the little post there, it's like a little armadillo post. It's hard on one side. So if a car runs into it, it bumps them back very aggressively but if on a bike it's kind of not a little more soft and curved on one side so this is actually a kind of fun innovation that they're trying out in denver they haven't had these kinds of um bike lanes uh protection yet so i love it i think it's great it, as you said the install goes quickly it disrupts businesses less um it it gets in quickly and people have loved it i, I see it full of scooters full of people on bikes even people in wheelchairs rolling on it all the time it's it's been really popular for the neighborhood yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that, you know, people seem to be loving it. Uh, talk a little bit about that adjustment period that, that drivers had uh, for this, because I'm it, inevitably there's resistance and there's people who complain and say, oh, my God, this is going to be the end of the world for me, either from a driving perspective or from a business perspective. How, how you know, this is months later. How, how is all that dust settled? Yeah, it's it's going fine. Honestly, there's I've heard, you know, there there's certain times when you see bike infrastructure go in that you get a lot of objection um, to it just from the, the sake of change or the aesthetics changing. I have not heard that at all for this particular bike lane or really any of the bike lanes um, that have gone into downtown recently. It's been really popular. I mean, all all the data shown both from studies in Denver and studies internationally and and nationally that bike lanes are good for business. They help uh, local businesses because people on bikes tend to shop more often and tend to patronize the businesses on the street. It makes the street safer for everybody. You know, Wes Marshall um, at our own CU Denver, we're really excited to have him in town. He did a study that showed that bike lanes make the road safer for drivers, pedestrians, and people that bike and people on scooters. So I, I think it's a win-win all around. Well, we believe that and we know that. But are you saying that the the Denver businesses here in the downtown area kind of are clued into that now? We're really lucky to have the downtown Denver partnership. They are a very forward thinking organization that wants to have a vibrant downtown community to support our local businesses. And they get it. They, they've been supportive of these multimodal connections. They've been very supportive of putting in more bike lanes. You know, downtown Denver is is 
like a lot of other downtowns that we've had a few struggles after COVID. Not as many people are coming downtown to work and, and they're seeing, you know, a lot of this multimodal transportation is a great way to help v- revitalize downtown in addition to all the other work that they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And as this video is continuing to, to, to flow here, we, we saw that we needed to get from one side of the street to the other side of the street. So we had that diagonal that, that we sort of went through um, and then we're, we're making our final uh, way over to the, the Union Station area. Uh, and and you, you mentioned something very important there. And, and that was, you know, talking about the downtown Denver ship, you know, partnership, <laughs> downtown Denver partnership, not Denver ship, <laughs> but you know what I meant. Yeah. Um, but they, and they were the entity that was behind the Viva streets too. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. were. Yeah. Um, we're really lucky to have them. They brought in uh, the Denver streets partnership as well to help do it. A lot of the logistics and promotions for the event. Uh, but they, they recognize the, the benefits of activating streets of how much fun it is and how many people are going to come downtown and support our local businesses when we're having events like this. Yeah. And again, the downtown uh, Denver uh, partnership and the, uh, uh, the Denver streets partnership is here that a Denver streets partnership. And, and again, these are NGOs. These are non-government entities, uh, nonprofits. And in this case, the, 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 the downtown, um, you know, the, the, Den, the Denver business, the downtown Denver uh, partnership is really looking at, again, trying to activate and revitalize and, 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 and bring people in. And so Viva Streets is, is an open streets event. It's just like we see Ciclo Vias and, and, and those types of things. And you all had uh, a summer of them. They, uh, there was multiple opportunities to do this from May through August. And uh, May was a super cold month and June was a rain out event. And then finally in July, uh, you had a, a beautiful, beautiful day. And I was able to, to document that experience. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. It turned out great. You know, I, so many people in the community that went down there loved it and had an absolute blast. You know, I took my um, six-year-old, uh, excuse me, five-year-old, then five-year-old daughter down there and and had an absolute blast. Um, you know, she had never had the opportunity to ride her bike for more than, you know, little stints in, in some of the parks we have around Denver. And she got to pedal, you know, two or three miles and, and had an absolute blast. And we, you know, went to several, we went to a taco place afterward and had a great time. It was a really fun family day for our family. They had a hula hoop competition that Amy Kenrai uh, put on. Um, there were just a lot of really fun things going on. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So Alan, earlier you had mentioned uh, the Denver bicycle lobby. Uh, what is that all about? Yeah. The, the Denver bicycle lobby is a very grassroots organization. I don't, we don't even have a 501c3. It's just a group of residents in Denver that are lobbying for, you know, safer, more sustainable transportation, Uh, not just biking, but we've gotten involved to help with pedestrian advocacy, safe streets advocacy, uh, accessibility, you know, even even transit to a little bit in Denver. It it, it started really, you know, during a tragic summer when Alexis Bounds and a couple other people were killed within a span of of a few weeks uh, while biking in Denver. And it was founded by Rob Toffness, Jonathan Fertig, and, and John Rickey. And they put together a critical mass ride. And we had several hundred people come out and just kind of took over the streets. And they had a, uh, a little email template that, that folks could use at the end of the ride to email the mayor and the head of the Department of Transportation and, and a lot of our city council folks. And it got people's attention. It, it really did. They made it really easy for people to email them. Um, just to say like, Hey, this isn't okay. The people are dying and we need safer streets and we need better bike infrastructure, uh, so that this doesn't happen again. Yeah. And in fact, if we take a look here, um, on the, uh, at the very top, we see the, the Denver bicycle lobby candidate, uh, questionnaire responses. And, uh, you know, that really gets to the point that, it's a fairly politically active movement that you all have going on, uh, you know, there, you know, all of the organizations that we've talked about, you see that they they understand, you all understand 
at the organization's level, as the individual activist level, that you need to be politically active. You can't just be out there complaining about stuff and, you know, quote unquote, advocating for better stuff. You you all get really, really uh, active and engaged in the political process. Talk a little bit about that and the fact that you all have had a, a, a recent election. Uh, and I guess the other organization that we should probably mention is is also uh, Vamos, because they, they did a whole bunch of candidate uh, interviews as well. And I've had Avi Stopper on, on the, the, the channel here to talk about that program. Uh, but yeah, talk a little bit about that uh, recent election and uh, and what that has meant for creating more people-oriented streets. Yeah, I, I think what we've realized, you know, is that there is so much potential to shape the conversation with our elected officials, because ultimately when it comes down to it, a city's values can be seen in its budget, right? So when we see how money is being spent on, you know, road dollars versus bike versus transit versus pedestrian dollars, we really start to have an idea of how much of an impact it can make by shifting some of our budget to multimodal transportation, more sustainable, more equitable transportation options. So we at DBL, we've really started to get to know our city council folks, you know, uh, the mayor's office to, to a lesser extent and even gotten involved more in, in statewide politics too. So we, we've done everything from trying to shape the city budget. Uh, we got involved with several council members, Councilwoman uh, Cita Baca and Torres and Councilman, uh, former Councilman Clark as well. And, and we had a big movement to try to decriminalize jaywalking here in Denver uh, a few years ago. So we got very involved and, and, and we're part of the leadership team of that movement as well. So we recognize that there there is a lot of power. When we come together as a group, we we do have the ability to start, you know, changing policy, to changing our streetscapes by supporting our great planners at the Department of Transportation Infrastructure here in Denver by helping shape the budget, by helping shape the conversation when these bike lanes are going in as well. And, and I think a, a large part of that too, and I'd be remiss for not saying it, is our community of journalists here in Denver. We've also developed relationships with them and we're helping to kind of shape the conversation around how we're covering crashes, how we're covering new bike lanes going in and, and the budget as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now I want to uh, play a little bit of video from yesterday uh, with your new, new mayor, uh, Mike Johnston. Uh, and this is something that you had posted why don't you go ahead and set this up as to as to what this is you know all about here and then we'll we'll sort of go backwards and play it from the beginning so set this up what is what is this all about yes yeah, so this is really exciting this is the grand opening of the Larimer Street bridge in Denver we've got uh, mayor Mike Johnston uh, councilman Chris Hines who's a great multimodal advocate here in Denver and uh, Adam Phipps who's the director uh, executive director of the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure so this was a celebration this was the opening of this bridge that's been under construction for a few years and it it was an exciting moment because you can see here when we zoom out, it used to be kind of a, a, a sewer, an arterial sewer that just drained cars onto Spear Boulevard and they reshaped it. They, they widened the sidewalks. They created a bi-directional bike lane. They put in uh, now one car lane on the bridge and they even put in some public gathering spaces, little benches and things like that. But it was part of a Denver bond uh, package that started a while back that voters approved. One of the many things that voters approved on there and, and folks were really excited to celebrate the moment. Uh, myself, I was standing next to uh, Jake Cohen. I'm the secretary for our, our Citizens Advisory Board for the Department of Transportation. Jake is one of our, our, our board co-chairs and we both got invited uh, to this to help celebrate the minutes. a big win for Denver. It's not just a bridge, it's, it's really a connection for people to come from downtown Denver, specifically lower downtown Denver, to the Auraria campus, which is our biggest college campus. It's actually three colleges Community College of Denver, Metro State, University of Colorado Denver all sit on this huge campus that you can see in the background. And you see so many students walking, biking, that'll take transit into downtown and then they'll have to walk over here or, or take their bike over here. And it's a much more inviting space to really connect the two areas that have really been divided by Spear Boulevard for, for quite some time because it is a very unpleasant uh, street to cross. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, press play here and actually uh, hear from the mayor. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. Delighted to get to join you. Uh, thank you for 
Uh, joining us at this historic opening, I am joined by a number of incredible leaders who helped make this entire project possible. I'm delighted to get to be here and celebrate its completion. Uh, we all had a part in this, which is in the 2017 bond. We all voted uh, for this specific project to be able to make this connection possible. And I'd say there are a couple of things I'm very excited about today. One is we know one of the great crown jewels of Denver is the Auraria campus. Uh, it is the place where I think the largest number of first time college students in the in the city are educated as the greatest population of young people of color who are getting educated in higher ed in Colorado are housed right behind us. And we quite literally want to open up the door of opportunity for all of those students. We want to open up that door by bringing them right into downtown Denver. And so this connector finally helps bridge the thriving, vibrant community of the Auraria campus with the thriving, vibrant community of downtown in a way that makes it much easier for, as Councilman says, people to walk, bike, or roll uh, any place that they want to. And so we, our estimate is that there will be three or 5,000 students a day uh, who will come to and from this campus through this pedestrian uh, walkway. And that means people that are walking, people that are biking, people that are rolling, uh, which both makes it safer, makes it less impact on the climate, makes it better uh, impact on our environment and our ecosystem and provide safe paths for people to get to and from all the places they want to go. So we think this is not only a great opportunity for Auraria and for downtown, I think it's a great model for what we hope to do in places all around the city. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to give it over to a person who had far more to do with actually making this happen. Amazing. Yeah. That, uh, very, very cool to see this. I'm also going to play a little bit of the video that you shot uh, with uh, David Pulsifer. Uh, David, uh, of course, is is part of the the Denver uh, Department of Transportation uh, and, and Infrastructure, the Design Group. Uh, but I, I, that just echoes exactly what you just said of just how important this connection is. And th these images, too, of of seeing what it's like being able to get there, because th these are ultimately very close destinations. These are not very far apart. And it's so incredibly important for us to see these opportunities where you have you know, meaningful, you know, destinations and connectivity that can take place. So go ahead and take it, take it away. Uh, tell, show us or tell us what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. You can see one thing I'll call out here. If you look on the right of the screen, you can see there's some green infrastructure there where uh, runoff is going to be going into there and it's going to be kind of filtering the water that'll drain into Cherry Creek and things like that. But you can see here, it's great. We've got, there's the campus in front of you there and we're coming back around. You can see there's a bike signal specifically for people that are biking. We've got the bi-directional bike lane on one side, uh, the, the car travel lane on the other side. We've got really nice planters uh, and concrete protecting the bike lane. It was kind of fun. They, they shut down the intersection, just put it on a bike only signal for us to go across as kind of the grand opening. Right. But just want to call out, you know, David and his team, Riley uh, was the planner that did this. And it's just such an elegant design, you know, the way that they kind of incorporated both the multimodal transportation elements and the little bit of the community space there with the bridge crossing and, and crossing over Spear. And I just, I love it. It's, it's going to be a really great, um, addition for Denver for generations to come. Um, and shout out to David in particular. He is one of uh, the most amazing planners I've worked with. He bikes all the way up from Littleton every day. Um, he lives down uh, there and, and bike commutes every type of weather. He puts studs on in the winter and he's really one of the planners that's walking uh, walking the walk of, of the talk that he's doing, so to speak, or walking the talk, I should say. Uh, so we're really lucky to have him and his leadership and, and most of his teams like that. Most of the planners that I speak with here in Denver, a lot of them don't have cars. They rely on bikes. They rely on transit um, and, and they really get it. And it's really great to see the up and coming generation of folks that are really shaping the city um, that really understand this stuff so well. Fantastic. That's great. This is just so freaking cool and, and awesome that, that you, you have this. And I, I want to scroll on your X feed, your Twitter feed. I, I can't get used to saying X, but yeah. Uh, you reposted this from Denver Bicycle Lobby uh, that basically said that you just mentioned earlier, you, you channeled the fact that you, a reflection of a city's values is in their their budget. And yet, holy heck, you guys are facing a proposed 42 percent cut in your, your budget for doing this good work. What the hell is going on? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll paint the good news first, right? The good news is I think we've had over 130 or so miles of new bike lanes added over well, the course okay, of the last few right years. Right? Pause right there, though. I know that not all, all of that 130 some odd miles are as good as what we saw on Blake Street. That's a right. lot yeah. of those are nothing more than painted bike lanes, which are not considered all ages and abilities. So I just want that's to right. clarify that. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that's an important thing to add in. There has been some really good infrastructure put in. I, I still think we have a ways to go on. You know, I love the concept of our neighborhood bikeways. I could think, you know, similar to what Avi at, at Bike Streets has said, I think we could use a lot more diverters on those neighborhood bikeways to really even reduce traffic more. Yeah, painted bike lanes aren't really cutting it. I, I typically would would never consider biking with my kiddos on, on a painted bike lane. Um, and I know a lot of adults in Denver that, that would consider it as well because they don't feel it's comfortable enough. So, yes, we have tremendous uh, things to celebrate about those 130 miles. But, yeah, there, there's definitely some room for improvement, too. Yeah. So, OK, so now we're faced with a, a, a budget crisis in the midst of momentum. Having just gone through this election, you have elected a mayor who you believe is, you know, if we believe his words that he just said, is very much behind this. Is is Denver a strong mayor system or a weak mayor system? Yeah, Denver is a strong mayor system. So the mayor okay, so really gets so, to dictate the budget. Uh, the city council has influence on the budget, but it, it really, you know, the, the departments are run by the mayor and the budget mm -hmm. is ultimately uh, painted by the mayor or planned by the mayor initially. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, all right, mayor. <laughs> We got yeah, you elected. So, <laughs> just elected in July. You know, um, he's yeah. really, you know, which I think is important. He's really been focused on the housing issue here in Denver. You know, housing uh, policy is really transportation policy. So I'm excited about the work that he's doing right now. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do think there's room for improvement uh, of, of funding more multimodal transportation, whether it's biking, transit or pedestrian. We're really excited to have initiative uh, 307 passed largely due to the leadership of Jill Locantori at the Denver Streets Partnership. Jill is leading a, a committee right now to talk about, hey, what tweaks can we make to make the, the fee structure to that a little more equitable funding so we don't have, you know, certain people that might have, you know, sidewalks on three sides of their house paying several thousand dollars a year, maybe, you know, capping that in some way. There's a lot of conversations about what, what could be done there. But I think the most important thing to, to know here is that we're on the right track with sidewalks in Denver, thanks to Jill's leadership of getting this initiative passed, which I think is really exciting. But I think there's still a lot that we can do on Vision Zero, on multimodal transportation. Um, and as you can see on the slide that's up here, you know, the, the people that uh, have the highest percentage basis of commuting by bike or, or the folks with the lowest income. I see it all the time on our arterial streets here, people going up and down the sidewalk on Federal or Colfax Boulevard, where you can tell they're just trying to make their way to work or shopping and things like that. And we have so much room to improve their experience as residents as well. Yeah. And I get it. I, I get that cities have a multitude of very, very serious issues that they're dealing with, uh, with affordable housing, with homelessness, with, you know, da, 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 da. But this slide drives the point home of that when we talk about affordability, when we talk about housing, it's not just the cost of housing. It's housing slash transportation. It's both. And that's why you, you that's why you cannot forget that, you know, investing in active transportation infrastructure is so linked to affordability when it comes to housing, because it's it, it's the household uh, budget is, you know, those two biggest things that you have there are, you know, your rent and, you know, you know, what's your transportation? How can you, you know, can you walk? Can you bike? Can you use public transit? Or are you committed to a car payment and all the associated costs that come with, you know, auto dependence and car dependency? Yeah, I don't know if you saw it, John, but there was a viral post going around uh, this week. It was a mom from the Midwest. She had posted her monthly budget and, you know, housing was a big chunk on there. You know, you could see that it was struggling to make ends meet. And a large chunk of it was was the car and and the fuel cost. And, you know, her on her list of things that she couldn't afford but needed to was, you know, I think it was like 500 bucks in, in a car repair. And for folks that are living paycheck to paycheck, I think she listed on there that she was making $20 an hour. $500 for a car repair is a very 
big hit. So I think we do need to give people choices. Like not everyone can can choose to bike or take transit, but we need to give people that option for for those that can. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that it it just gets lost so often, you know, in these political discussions and when you start looking at city budgets and you start, you know, having the, these conversations about, okay, well, what, where do we cut? We need to cut our budget based on the revenues coming in, da, 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 da. And, you know, immediately they sort of go to, well, you know, let's, let's cut back on this. It doesn't seem like it's a good return on investment and we'll shift it over to these other areas. All the while realizing that you could fund the entire bicycle network within any given city for a basically about the same amount of cost for one major auto centric intersection or interchange. You know, it, it's just like it's it's really it's just not that expensive to actually build a place that is more people oriented versus the auto infrastructure is just incredibly. I mean, we talk about hundreds of millions of dollars for an intersection that could, you know, again, lighter, quicker, cheaper, be able to do some of those neighborhood uh, greenway or bikeway diverters and, you know, just get them in. And then just like the Blake street, you know, lighter, quicker, cheaper, get something in lighter materials, get them in, you know, reserve that real estate. You can always come back in and build the pretty stuff like you had on the Larimer Bridge there. Yeah, yeah, we saw that here in Denver, the I-25 and Broadway interchange um, was rebuilt a little while ago, and I think to the tune of $80 million, you know, and that could have built out the entire Denver bike network um, so yeah, and, that, and that's even that's even cheap. I mean, I'm I'm stone's throw away from one that I think was 320 million. <laughs> you know, it's just auto infrastructure is so incredibly expensive, but they don't blink an eye at it. You know, it's just like oh well, we're gonna f- we're gonna leverage some uh, federal dollars through the state, and and we're gonna be able to make this happen, and we'll pay a portion of it. But even the city's portion of the auto inter- you know, auto centric infrastructure, auto oriented infrastructure is incredibly expensive. And like you said, yeah, you could you could fund you know uh, that first phase of the entire bicycle network, that that first phase of safer pedestrian crossings, uh, you know, in lighter, quicker, cheaper materials with that same amount of money or even less. Yeah, we're going through that conversation in Denver right now. Again, um, we're, we're talking about expanding Pena Boulevard, which is our uh, highway that runs from I-70 to Denver International Airport. You know, the airport is going to take advantage of a lot of potential federal funds to span that, but Denver will still be on, on the hook for 70 or $80 million at least, right? So, you know, we think about what kinds of things we could do for safer pedestrian crossings and, and things like that in the neighborhood that Pena Boulevard is, is being expanded in versus saving five or 10 minutes off of, of car commuters time just initially for the first five years, because it's going to be just as crowded, right? Uh, because of induced demand after it's in there for a little while. Um, and we saw that on I-25. I mean, one piece of good news that we have is thanks to the Denver Streets Partnership, Jill Locantori, Molly McKinley, is we push back pretty hard against I-25 being expanded in central Denver. Uh, and that is a really big victory. It goes through communities of color like Sun Valley and Val Verde. Um, and if you look at the, the health data in these neighborhoods, it is, it is so horrifically worse than the rest of Denver because they're within that you know, half mile, a quarter mile of the interstate. And it's, it's a really big victory that the Colorado Department of Transportation, I, I really applaud them for choosing not to pursue this interstate highway expansion right through the middle of our city. So that, that is one piece of good news that we are starting to learn uh, a little bit in some cases about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know the Rocky Mountain Institute also uh, got involved and helped uh, build a tool that uh, demonstrated that expanding I-25 in in that segment was going to result in X amount of uh, additional, uh, you know, carbon uh, emissions and and really, you know, helped create a a freeway fighter tool uh, that is now being uh, or is now being used, you know, in other locations to, to be able to say, hey, 
no, 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 no. If we're expanding lane miles, this is the impact. And you guys are all glossing over the fact that it, it will have a negative impact. Yeah. And we're really lucky to have RMI coming out with tools like that and furthering the conversation as well. And also, you know, um, back when Denver had a streets blog, a local streets blog, Dave Sachs, Uh, And Andy Bossman really kind of led the charge on that as well, looking at we had expanded the southern section of I-25 here in Denver, we called the T-Rex project. And through that project, we saw that traffic delays were just as bad only five years later. Right. So we're like, hey, this is going to fix congestion in reality because of induced demand. We know it doesn't work, but we even have the data here in Denver to show that it's just as bad as it was within a few years. Yeah. Well, earlier we were talking a little bit about the the neighborhoods and the neighborhood bikeways and uh, the the things that we we have been seeing that have been popping up uh, around the country and around the globe. One of the the really positive trends that have really taken off in the last couple of years has been the 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 idea of a bike bus. And so I wanted to have you here to to talk a little bit about the bike bus that you have been behind, but. I'll leave that as the setup. You you take it from here. What what uh, you know? Kind of what inspired you? Yeah, uh, Coach Balto. It was seeing Coach Balto's Twitter post and 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 you know his TikTok post on the bike bus. He started Alameda Elementary in Portland and getting to learn more about uh, even before him what they were doing in Barcelona with the Bissy bus. And it's, it's it was just like that looks really cool. And, and I saw it going on. And last winter I was like what if we did this at our school? And I started talking around with some other dads that I saw were bringing their kids to school on cargo bikes or their kids were biking next to them on regular bikes. I was like, hey, do you think this would be fun? Do you think this would work here? And one of of my fellow parents, uh, fellow adults at the elementary school, was like, yeah, let's do this. And so we we reached out to the school administration and the PTA. We're like, hey, we want to try this. We, we, for, for bike to school day, which I think like May 3rd or May 4th last year. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. We'll, we'll help you advertise it. Right. So the first thing we had to do is find out a safe route. Right. And, and a route that would be relevant for a portion of the school. So you can see here on the screen, we, we picked uh, 25th Avenue. It's very quiet. My fellow dad, Tom uses it to bike in with his kids every day to school. And um, Tom and I were like, yeah, let's use this. So we went up and down it literally went back and forth several times, didn't see a single vehicle on it around the time that the kid's school was starting. It was like, yeah, this feels like a pretty safe place to go and and get things started. Fantastic. And so, you know, we end up launching it. Uh, uh, This says Wednesday, November 8th, though. What's this about? Was this last year? Yeah, this was the original sign we used. Uh, Okay. Put up this sign, you know, my, my career is in sales and marketing. So it's like, we have to let people know about this. We have to raise awareness for it, right? Yeah. So I went to our local print shop and and put this out. And at the time it said Wednesday, May 3rd or 4th, whatever it was. Uh, but I, you can see I've just been changing the date and, and right. manually writing some stuff on there. I've even updated <laughs> the time. I'm too cheap to go and get another sign. I just, just scratched <laughs> it out and put in our new start time for that with the earlier start time with the school. But I just put it next to the gate. When yeah. we uh, started school, so parents could see it and I would stand next to it and they'd be like, what, what's this thing about? You know, and I just tell the story of what we were going to do. And um, yeah, I, I, I thought like on the first day that like, yeah, we might have you know, like 10 or 12 kids that would come out. But the first time we did it, it was a lot of fun. We probably had, gosh, I don't know, I'd say maybe 50 kids and parents that, that came out for that first ride. It was a blast. Wow. Wow. And here's your uh, actual uh, website here, the brown uh, bike bus dot com. You set that up. And so you've got all the all the details here. Uh, how frequently are we doing the uh, the bike bus? Yeah, for us, you know, it's twice a month um, during the warmer weather months. And we're shooting for once a month during the colder weather months, you know, pending, you know, the, how the weather is pending the temperatures and things like that. We're still trying to figure out you know, what is that threshold? I, th- I think with any ice on the streets or snow on the streets, we'll probably forego that. Uh, I think as adults, some folks are comfortable riding, but I- I'm not comfortable taking the kiddos out in the snow. But I think temperatures, I think our gut says nothing lower than 25 degrees. Um, the school's cut off for using the playground is 20 degrees. So I figured, you know, bump that up a little bit, but we're excited to see how this goes. This is our first full year of, of doing it and trying it out. Yeah. Yeah. How many uh, parents and how many kids 
are sort of routinely riding uh, now that the bike bus is, has gotten going. And this is the same question that I posed to, to Sam Balto when I've had him on, because ultimately we'd love to see kids riding their bikes every day. And just up the road from you in Boulder, I mean, especially at the middle school level, it, it, you see hundreds of bikes on a daily basis parked there because, you know, they, you know, or have, they're fortunate enough to be able to have enough safe routes that, you know, kids can literally be free range kids. And so they, they routinely ride to elementary school and, and middle school and high school and then on into college. Uh, how many people, you know, at Brown are, are starting to, to ride more frequently uh, you know, on the non-bike bus days. Yeah, you know, so I'll, I'll start out by saying one of our bike bus leaders, Dan, his kids are a little bit older than mine are, and he's been at the elementary school for a while. He said when he started, he was literally the only person that would show up on a bike, right? So, and, and now there's probably, especially on the warmer weather days, there's probably a dozen parents that are showing up on cargo bikes, uh, and dropping their kids off, yeah, which is which is awesome. And sometimes when the weather's really nice, even more than that. So it, it, it's been evolving over time. Last year was our first year at the elementary school with my kids in the younger grades. And I'd say there were typically maybe four or five bikes out on the bike racks um, beforehand. Since we've started the bike bus, I, I think half the game is just showing people that biking to school is possible. And that's my hope with the bike bus is even though we're not able to do it every week, just based on our constraints of volunteers and bandwidth and, and funding, it's showing kids that it's possible. And we've anecdotally, I've seen a lot more kids biking to school, maybe 20 or 30 kids on the bike racks on, on warmer weather days. And it's just a blast. And, and for any parent that's thinking about it, you can see my smile there. It's really hard not to smile when you do it, just seeing how much fun the kids are having. It's just an absolute blast. And you can see one of our parents there wrote in, Brown uh, is about 30% choice. So about 30% of the people from our elementary school don't live in the neighborhood that are within a mile of the school, right? So um, it's fun to see. We even had parents coming from the other side of town that are finding some of the new neighborhood bikeway routes that have recently been put in in the last few years. So it's kind of fun. It's forcing them to discover these new ways to get around the neighborhood via bike. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the reason why I wanted to emphasize, you know, the neighborhood bikeway concept is that uh, pretty much all the, the images that we've seen, there hasn't been a single bit of, of true, quote unquote, by protected bicycle infrastructure. It's not what this is about. Your route that you chose is 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 a route that's a, a quieter community residential street. And really, the key thing is, is low volume, low speed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the Avi stopper bike streets model here in Denver, right? It's finding these streets that people can always already use today that are part of the bikeway network. And this is 25th Avenue, two blocks over is 23rd Avenue, actually has a painted bike lane. But I don't feel comfortable taking the kid on the kids on that street because the speed limit's 30 miles an hour, there's no protection. And, you know, you've got a fairly decent volume of, of cars commuting through there in the morning. So, yeah, this, this is kind of our our bread and butter is finding these quiet streets that are easy and safe for the kids to get to school on. Yeah. And I was having a conversation this morning with a parent that was like, yeah, the bike bus, you know, kind of showed us how we get there and, you know, we're, we're using it now to bike to school, which is fun. Yeah. And this is a, a picture of uh, the, the, the bike rack that is there. And uh, yeah, I, I would say we're, we're due for new bike racks. Yeah, <laughs> let's get the standard Schaefer uh, you know, upside down staple uh, bike racks, folks, and uh, let's expand that. And and like I said, you know, the example uh, up the road there in Boulder is they literally have hundreds of the Schaefer bike racks, uh, the upside down staple um, standard bike racks. And, and it's just amazing when you see them all filled up by the time uh, the, the school gets started. And, uh, and they continue to ride, you know, throughout even even the snowy months. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the three bike racks we have at Brown Elementary, or I should say Brown International Academy. We're an IB, IB school. I should use the technical name for the school. But this is a non-bike bus day, right? And before you'd maybe see four bikes on the rack and, and all three of the racks were full on that day. So it was really great to see, you know, yes, we could absolutely use an upgrade. Unfortunately, school budgets right now here in Denver are, are 
are pretty slim. So we're going to have to do some bake sales, so to speak. Um, yeah, to get I was say, let, let's, let's do some uh, brown, uh, you know, school uh, uh, GoFundMe. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love to do that. Uh, and I'd love to see a bike route out front of school. You can see the, the adult bike rack there is one of the teachers that bikes in every day. It was really fun. The first day um, we had a, a bike bus. She was actually manning the gate that day and welcoming students into school. And, and she was so, you know, caught up in the moment as a person that's bike, seeing all these kids coming to school. She actually got emotional in that moment. It was so exciting for her and, and for me too, you know, it, and it was really great to see that moment of seeing the potential of just, you know, uh, the safety and numbers concept of the bike bus and, and how much it's helped uh, get more kids biking. Well, and I know that you got your inspiration by seeing some of the others that were out there. And again, Sam, uh, I profiled him uh, here on the podcast and on the channel, as well as Megan Ramey up in Hood River. Uh, you know, she had been doing her bike train for, for some time. Uh, walk through the, you know, sort of the, the, the steps that you took. You had mentioned, you know, OK, get together with another dad. We thought about a route. We, we tech you know, took a look at that, but then you also kind of said, okay, let's, let's kind of, you know, organize ourselves and make sure that we are able to communicate, you know, to the kids and to the, the volunteer parents, you know, some of the things that you're trying to do. So uh, walk us through, you know, sort of, you know, where you're coming from in terms of uh, putting all these steps together and anything else that uh, another parent uh, or group of parents uh, or even, you know, like in the case of Sam, he's a teacher, uh, you know, might consider if they want to do a bike bus in their neighborhood. Yeah, I, I think number one is building the crew, building the people that are involved and, and interested in it. And we're really lucky that we've not only had parents get involved with it, but we've had community members, people from the bicycle advocacy community, people that live in the neighborhood that have volunteered, that have nothing to do with the school besides living nearby. So, you know, Ryan White is one of our amazing volunteers. He's been out for a lot of the, the rides that we've had. We've had Bicycle Colorado staff members come out to help us, Bicycle Colorado alumni, even people from our neighborhood organization. There are a few retired folks that have come out to help. And so, you know, number one was getting, getting buy-in, building the crew. Number two was figuring out the route. We love quiet streets in our case. And number three was kind of going through the logistics of it, right? It's like, okay, how are we going to keep the kids safe? You know, our first few, our first ride, we didn't have a ton of volunteers and we just thought that the kids would, you know, follow all the rules of the road. In the case of the younger kids, that was not the case. So I was like, we need to get more people out here monitoring all these intersections, right? That was a huge epiphany moment for me of like, all right, we need, we need some more help kind of thing. So it's, in um, other words, you say you're saying it's sort of like herding cats. Yeah, it is. It is. And the kids are great and they're amazing and they're having so much fun, but yeah. you know, they're, they're kids, right? So what we've done is we have four stop signs along the way where it's not a four way stop, right? Where, where we don't have the right of way. So we're having one volunteer at each of those monitor those intersections to encourage the kids to stop a, or, or more importantly, to, make sure that that the kids are not going through if a car is coming right 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 and and then we have one collector street that we cross at the end of the ride and we have everybody get together in one big clump of a group and then we have some parents go out and just plug the intersection and once we sure the cars are stopped we'll have the kids cross and we'll once we get to the block where the school is we go around on the sidewalk because that block is probably the most dangerous traffic place in the city, you know, or like any school for the 10 minutes before school starting as folks are rushing yeah. there. So we just have the kids go on the sidewalk and it works great. Yeah. Yeah. What I find is funny is that, yeah, I see here uh, after we cross Lowell, you know, stay on the sidewalk or we can get there because you're trying to get to, as you were saying, you were setting it up by saying it's one of the more dangerous places. And that's sort of the the irony. It's sort of funny. It's funny, not funny, is that our most dangerous places, you know, for our kids trying to get to school is the area right around the school. Yeah, it really is. I was having a, a conversation with our, our crossing guard today. We have two of them yeah. um, and was speaking with her. And she's like, yeah, a lot of parents just aren't paying attention when they're coming in or when they're leaving. And, and really, we should be so cautious. We should be on pins and needles for anyone that's driving yeah. around the school because you know there's going to be kids there and you know that kids are not capable of having that level of cognition that adults do to really be sure to slow down and look both ways because they're kids they, they they're going to run out in the street sometimes and to the best of the ability of, of us as parents we try to protect them and make sure that they don't do that but it happened to me a few weeks ago where my daughter i was like okay stella stop there and she 
even though I said stop there, she just kept going into the intersection and a parent wasn't really paying attention and started to pull into it. I had to scream to get both of them to stop. And it, it's terrifying, right? Schools are very dangerous places when we're focusing our infrastructure on uh, having it be convenient for car drop off and pickups. Yeah. Well, and, and that's one of the reasons we're seeing sort of globally an international movement of the school streets uh, program where essentially, you know, for blocks around a, a school, you know, I, I don't want to say blocks, that's an over exaggeration. But you know what I mean is that the blocks around a school and the immediate area at the school is is essentially completely closed off so that you you eliminate that whole parent drop off scenario. And, and I don't want to blame parents. I mean, you know, it's, they're doing this because they, uh, you know, they, you know, want their kids to be able to arrive to school safely, et cetera. But in doing so, it, it creates exactly what you're saying, a dangerous situation for literally every other kid. Uh, and it also sort of, um, ignores the fact that the most dangerous thing that that a parent can do is actually put a kid in a car and take them somewhere. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, when you look at the number one area of, of where injuries and fatalities come from kids, it's, it's actually riding in cars and being in car crashes and collisions. Yeah. Yeah. And in and, and our elementary school drop off, it's, it's really set up for convenience. So parents can drop their kids right off the gate and they walk five feet from the car door to the fence. And, and I understand that you as a parent uh, want something that's that's going to be safe for your kids. Right. To, to get them into school. But if, if we change the paradigm a little bit, instead of focusing on convenience and making that street safer, we could have a much better experience if we had parents maybe park a block or two away and then walk their kid to the gate or, or things like that. But unfortunately, you know, we're not really set up to prioritize that right now at our school and most schools around Denver. Yeah. Now we're, we're stopped on this particular uh, image because it makes me smile. Uh, and it's something that when I interviewed Sam, uh, Coach Balto, I realized just how important the music aspect was. So uh, apparently music is important uh, with the Brown Bike Bus as well. Yeah, it is. Coach Balto, you know, I've been messaging him over Twitter for months now and he's awesome. He's been such an amazing mentor for me. And he's like, hey, music is key. You got to do music. He sent me links to some, you know, speakers that I can consider and, and things like that. And it really is. It just makes such a positive, fun experience. You know, my one of my co-leaders, Tom, um, says like, hey, it's like we get to have a party every two weeks that just happens to move down 25th Avenue. It's a blast, you know, and, and the music, it does make it a lot of fun. So for anyone starting a bike bus, I'd say get a portable Bluetooth speaker. Um, and and it, 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 it's fun. You see the kids kind of dancing on their bikes and things like that. Some of the times they're singing along and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's a blast. Yeah. 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 It's good stuff. Is there anything that we haven't yet talked about today? It doesn't have to be about the, the Brown Bike Bus, but anything at all, uh, you know, to sort of close this out. Is there anything that we've missed about uh, the Denver area, the work that you all are doing and, you know, and, and, and this movement to try to create safer streets for everyone in the Denver area? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one thing about the Bike Bus that we haven't solved the problem for is how do we make it more equitable? right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a large percentage of kids in our neighborhood that don't have bikes, right? So my wife um, has actually been taking leadership on this, Kristen, and I'm really proud of her, has been reaching out to nonprofits like, hey, how can we get donations to these kids that don't have bikes so they can participate in it, so they can start to ride to school, you know? I, I, one other thing that, that I, I'm trying to understand is we have this thing in Denver called the inverted L. Right. We ha and I think most cities have this. You have the neighborhoods that are more affluent, that have historically gotten the resources and things like that. In my head, I'm like, how do we roll out bike bus? You know, Jason Bicycle Colorado has, has, has had this conversation with me. How, how do we roll this out across the city so more people can do this, especially in neighborhoods that have historically been underinvested in that, that don't necessarily have the resources? So that's that's something I'm struggling with. Of, I don't have the answer for, but trying to find out how do we give them better bike infrastructure? How do we give them better resources to be able to participate in fun, active transportation, things like this, that, you know, I, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess, you know, to sort of lean into this aspect of 
the, that relationship, and this is a conversation I recently had with, uh, with Chris Bruntlett with the Dutch Cycling Embassy, and he talked about the fact that oftentimes when we see, you know, the, the, the cargo bike scenario and the parents with, the, with, with, you know, moving the kids around in the cargo bike, you also have to step back and say, if they're still carting the kids around in a cargo bike when they're already at the age when they, you know, could actually be riding themselves to school, then it may be an indication that the parent is is not comfortable with the uh, the riding conditions to be able to let the kid ride, you know, either supervised or unsupervised to school. In other words, it, it's sort of an indication that, yeah, that's cool. They're riding the bike via cargo bike better than driving. But at the same time, it's an indication that we're not yet there yet of having, uh, you know, kids be free range kids and, and kids being able to, you know, get around their city, uh, in their community and be able to get to meaningful destinations like school, like the park, like their friend's pet place on their own. That's one of the biggest things that, that tugs at me as a parent right now is we, uh, we're a turn family. We've got a GSD and an HSD. We, we love those bikes. Um, and I, don't know what I'm going to do when my kids get too big for that bike, probably around, you know, age 10, 11, 12, right? It's like, it's like what will you do? What's your purpose? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like how, how do I get them around? Right. Safely, yeah, comfortably. Yeah. Do yeah. I feel comfortable with them biking to high school? Right. A lot of our neighborhood bikeways are massive improvements for adults. I'm really grateful for all the work of all the folks in, in Dottie, our transportation department that have, that have put those through but we're not yet there yet at the level of comfort and safety for me as a parent that I would feel comfortable letting my kids bike on them in five years or so. We're, we're, we're just not there. It's, it's, it's still, it's, it's an improvement. It's very, I'm very grateful for them, but we're not there yet in terms of truly making our streets safe and accessible and comfortable for starting at age seven right now. Right. We're not there. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's a, a little bit of an interesting dilemma, you know, uh, for parents who, you know, at, at first, you know, it's, it's like, especially in our North American paradigm of, of we, we drive our kids everywhere, you know, and it's like, oh, well, okay, we're going to change that paradigm. And now it's not going to be, you're driving your kids everywhere. Now we're going to like be biking them to these meaningful destinations, et cetera. It's a whole nother thing to be like, oh, yeah, now they have the the skills and the confidence and the and the infrastructure is there and it's like okay, bye. <laughs> you know, have, have fun, be safe. It that's a huge step for North American parents whereas in the in the case of, of like Dutch and Danish uh, parents they're like no 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 no. I mean Go, 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 you know, start get, working on those skills. And by the time they're 12, they have to pass their exams to demonstrate that they can get around their entire city on their own. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, it's, it's definitely a paradigm shift, right? You know, I, I think our, our, our mayor and I love him. I think he has so much potential for us was, was meeting with the Dutch cons consulate the other day from San Francisco, the consul general that was out here in Denver and was like, yeah, but when you have kids, you start to, you have to drive them everywhere. Right. So I, I think there is a tremendous opportunity there for us in, in the advocacy community to show people like, no, you don't have to drive them everywhere. There are ways like whether you're looking at cargo bikes or even e-bikes for kids or regular bikes for kids of, of not necessarily being confined to the car. Right. So I think there's tremendous potential for us to educate folks on what the choices are. But there's also tremendous opportunity for us to really go out there and create that safer infrastructure. So, and, and I think that's a valid concern of his that like, hey, like as a parent, you don't have a choice. Cause I think for a lot of parents in a lot of places in Denver, he's right. That is not a choice. Uh, there is not safe cycling infrastructure right now. We're, we're lucky that our neighborhood was one of the first ones to have a build out of community transportation networks, but we're, we're not there yet for a lot of town right now. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, that that is kind of part of 
why cities in North America and around the globe are are striving to try, try to build out a safe and inviting all ages and abilities network because the benefits are just so incredibly powerful. When we look at societies, you know, like the, the cities throughout the Netherlands, I mentioned Danish, you know, the, the, the Copenhagen example uh, and several other, you know, communities around the globe. When you look at those societies where kids are able to develop that sense of autonomy and are able to to get around and understand their city. It's amazing what that does for them as they get become young adults and and beyond. So I, I, I think that it, it, yeah, it's kind of scary for us right now as to where we're at. But, you know, again, you don't have to go very far. You can you go up the road to Boulder and see, you know, where, you know, in, in certain neighborhoods, you know, in, in certain schools. It, it's amazing to see that level of independence that they they you know develop. And it spills over to not just in bicycles. I, I, I love when I when I ride the bus there. Uh, I'll, I'll notice that, you know, all sorts of middle schoolers are like using the skip and the hop and, you know, they're getting around town. Uh, so it's not always walking and biking. They also use transit very frequently, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the thing that gives me the most hope is that future generation of the potential for them to see what what's possible. And, you know, when the Dutch consul general here, he's pushed back saying, no, no, it's definitely possible to yeah. have your kids go out on their own and, and, but you have to have the infrastructure there and the opportunities for them to do so, to, to feel comfortable as a parent. Yeah. And, and I'm glad I was wonderfully, I was very, very heartened to see that the Dutch Council General was there. And uh, we've had the opportunity to have a long-term partnership with uh, the Dutch government and the Dutch cycling embassy uh, here in Austin, Texas. And so uh, I, I literally call the network that we're building here a Dutch-inspired network uh, for that reason, because of that you know decades-long uh, relationship and the amount of work that uh, has been gone been put in, invested in to try to create that safe and inviting network. Uh, It's a lot of work though, and you can only do so much protected infrastructure. It's very, very costly to do it very, very well. Uh, Yeah, you can do the lighter, quicker, cheaper, but at some point in time, you need to put in permanent infrastructure. But most importantly, what we have to do is slow motor vehicle speeds down. Most importantly, we need to bring the motor vehicle volumes down and we have to stop kind of caving into, you know, those, those VMT counts, those motor vehicle, you know, travel counts through areas and saying, well, we have to prioritize the movement of motor vehicles. We can't possibly take a lane away. You know, it's like you take getting rid of that, you know, mindset of level of service, you know, uh, for motor vehicles. Yeah. Well, one thing that, that brings me hope again, I, I feel like I'm a Denver streets partnership fanboy right now, but uh, Jill and, and Molly there led our 20 is plenty campaign. Uh, and a few years ago had our, you know, our neighborhood street speed limit reduced from 25 to 20, which I think that's going to help. But, you know, our most dangerous streets right now are not our neighborhood streets. When we think about vision zero here in Denver, people are consistently getting seriously injured or killed on our arterial streets. A lot of those are CDOT roads. One thing that gives me hope is I've just heard that they're going to be putting a chicane on Federal Boulevard, US 285, through our neighborhood here in kind of the Sloan's Lake Jefferson Park area. And that's really exciting. The other thing I've heard recently is that CDOT is now saying that they're no longer going to use the, I think it's the 85th percentile rule. Right when setting speed limits. And that gives me so much hope. In the past, I've had heard conversations of state traffic engineers for our, our state roads that go through our neighborhood. When you request the speed limit to be lowered, I've heard conversations around, well, they, they did a speed study and they're like, well, drivers are actually going faster. We're going to raise the speed limit, right? So it, it's giving me hope that we're now starting to throw the 85th percentile out because it's such an antiquated way of, of looking at safety. Yeah, We have a really long way to go with a lot of our, our traffic engineers of kind of bringing them up to a more modern look at safety as opposed to VMT and, you know, throughput of, of moving cars quickly. But I, I, I do have some hope that we are starting to kind of chisel around the edges of, of that and, and we are going to see some good things come. Yeah. Well, I'm hopeful too. And I will keep my fingers crossed uh, because yes, you, your, your biggest challenge, our biggest challenge 
you know, I, I think universally across most of, most of North America are some of those busier streets that are state owned. And so having a DOT that's sort of on board with this concept that it's not about moving number of motor vehicles, it's about creating safe environments. And in fact, uh, if you truly make it a safe and inviting environment for all modes, you will suddenly be able to move far a far greater number of people because uh, a really well-designed, protected bike infrastructure, bike lane can actually carry 10 times the number of people that motor vehicle travel lanes can carry uh, just with single occupancy vehicles. Uh, really, you know, sort of giving very, very solid competition to a, a, a well-run a streetcar line or tram. So it, it's, you know, good stuff. And, and I'm very, very stoked to see the progress that Denver is making. And I really applaud all of you, you this whole band of, of engaged citizenry there in the Denver area. You guys are rock stars. Keep up the great work. And Alan, it's been such a wonderful joy and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Yeah, John, thanks for having me. And, and we're really lucky here. It's it's definitely a village effort from everybody from the Denver Streets Partnership to Pedestrian Dignity um, and Bicycle Colorado, Denver Bicycle Lobby. We are really lucky to have such an active community of engaged folks here. And I, I think there's... Um, potential for so much more to come. So yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Alan. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the Active Towns channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content that I am creating, please help support my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org, click on the support button, and there's several different different options out there, including my Patreon crew, where patrons benefit from having early and ad-free access to these videos. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>